Hi folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is session number 375. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Hello, hello. Hopefully it's a nice surprise to get a little bit of uh, an extra episode dropped into the feed. I'm adding this session in here because I had the chance to chat with a repeat guest, Tom Bagri, who's the chief exec of Life Search, and to talk to them about their current experiences as a life insurance broking firm and advisor in the current pandemic. It makes for an interesting conversation. So I thought I'd uh, drop that in here and hope that you enjoy it. Obviously, before we get into all that, remember this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out here for ages and uh, you know every single show is possible because of their help. So thank you to them. Please do check out what they're up to, 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. You can tell I'm <laughs> slightly fingers and thumbs today because I'm in a slightly unusual position uh, putting this top and tail uh, on this episode together. I spoke to Tom a week or so ago, so forgive me if I'm knocking microphones and not looking straight at the camera sometimes. So Tom bagri has been on the show twice before. Um, regular listeners will know that I have a deal with Life Search. It's an affiliate arrangement. So if I send customers to them, Meaningful Money gets a cut of the commission if those customers take out a life insurance policy or an income protection policy uh, or something like that. Now, that's been a win-win for, for well, win-win-win, should we say, a win for me, Meaningful Money, win for Life Search. But particularly, it's been a win for the customers because without exception, everybody who's fed back to me about the process of dealing with Life Search has just raved about how easy it's been, how there's no sort of pressure in the sales process or anything like that. Um, that's rare, right? So it's it's been a great uh, setup for, for all concerned. Tom Bagri is just a giant in the financial services world. He has this incredibly sort of resonant voice and amazing presence. So you know when you're in a room with a guy, he's always great value and he's built a company based on his own values, which is also pretty rare these days, particularly in financial services. So hope you enjoy my conversation with Tom Bagri. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 375 for any links and notes based on today's show. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Tom Bagri. So it's my pleasure to welcome back for the third time, I believe, to the Meaningful Money podcast, Mr. Tom Bagri, CEO of Life Search. Tom, welcome back, my friend. How are you doing? Thank you. Very well indeed. Very well indeed. You are uh, bearing up in the current unpleasantness? I'm having a hilarious time. <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I, that's, you know, the moment I say that, I think about uh, how flipping lucky I am not yeah. to be a travel agent or, you know, in the cruise business or whatever. Um, we have to be hugely grateful. Uh, that we're still able to trade day to day, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's why I can afford to be slightly flippant about it. Um, but if you'll allow me that, the uh, no, the fun thing, fun thing in my life, is that I uh, I've got a perfectly nice house, really, uh, sort of house a CEO of Life Search should have, but <laughs> um, unfortunately, we decided to renovate it uh, this last winter, and um, the renovations are going absolutely fine until lockdown when they stopped. So the little two-bedroom flat we'd moved into, uh, which is perfectly cute and uh, by the river in London, so really lovely views, suddenly became quite tight when my two adult children <laughs> moved back from abroad and university and joined us. And uh, so now there are four of us in a two-bedroom flat, and I'm talking to you from my office, which is also, if you look carefully at the sofa, which is um, <laughs> underneath the picture that dominates the living room which is contiguous with the dining room and the kitchen and my wife's workstation. Uh, she's actually got a proper workstation. I don't have that. I have the sofa and a laptop uh, from which I run Life Search. So it, uh, and incredibly tolerant children um, <laughs> who everyone agrees I'm the biggest pain in the neck around here, no, no one else. So uh, yeah, we're all getting along just about okay. But looking out at July or whenever they're going to let us break free, uh, but <laughs> it's a long way away. <laughs> yeah, it uh, remains to be seen, doesn't it? And how about uh, Life Search in it all? How many employees are at Life Search? Uh, just about 500. Man alive. That's yeah. a big piece of work to get 500 people working from home. You know, 
Peter, there's a, it's a thing I've been preaching for a long time, uh, since 2007, which is before it became common currency, is that a business really needs to make clear what its purpose is. Uh, and it needs to run itself on, on, on values that everyone agrees to and, and, and that you, you, get, uh, you get to make your decisions for you. Mm. If you've got choice of A or B, does it serve our purpose? Does it fit our values? Well, we'll do whichever one does that best. Uh, and I've been doing that for a long time. So we've been home working. We, call it, we didn't call it home working or remote working. We called it flexible working mm-hmm. um, since 2005. Oh, wow. Uh, we've been letting people go home if they want to. The first chap is Dave, who is a good, really good advisor whose girlfriend lived in Ipswich and we don't have a branch in Ipswich. So he said, can't I go and work in Ipswich? And um, we said, yeah, go on then. And he, <laughs> he's still with us. And Joanne, is, his partner, is still a, a, a nurse in Ipswich. So, um, yeah, yeah, that was a perfect success story back then. And we've just, by the time COVID came along, everyone had a laptop. Everyone was able to work from home pretty uh, straightforwardly. And apart from a few broadband issues, we were live continuously. Fantastic. Uh, able to cope with what is actually a, was a surge in inquiries for, for a few days. But well, that was going to be my next question because it, I imagine something like this uh, focuses people's minds. Uh, I think I've been meaning to sort out protection for my family or my life and my income and things like that. So you've experienced uh, uh, an uptick in inquiries? Yeah. Yes and no. I think the um, there was a sort of surge, a, a huge surge uh, just in March at the start of lockdown, uh, you know, life, insu- uh, life insurance or rather actually more disability slash unemployment cover Okay, uh, was a bit like toilet paper and um, cleaning products or whatever. Mm. Uh, so there was a, a huge surge. Most of those inquiries really were uh, about needing cover sort of instantly for the short term. Mm. And that's those policies life searches never really yeah. uh, enjoyed uh, uh, recommending because clients who are in it for the short term are generally met by insurers who are playing them at their own game. And mm. the insurer is always cleverer than the client. So the cover mysteriously is not there when you need it most. Oh, yeah. that can happen. It doesn't always happen at all. Of course not, but can happen. So those very short t- term policies aren't our uh, game. And uh, we, uh, so we, we, we translated those discussions into proper longer term planning as best we could. But that initial surge uh, faded away uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and through April uh, and now May, we're seeing inquiry levels perfectly strong at that kind of pre-COVID level, okay. uh, maybe a little higher in places. Um, but yeah, the, the consumer is uh, uh, pretty much behaving normally in terms okay. of, of, of their protection buying habits. It- uh, as far as we can see. It does feel like things have found something of a level, but of course we all live in our own uh, bubble. I'm sure for, for many people it doesn't feel like that uh, at all. The, I mean, unemployment insurance is something I've always uh, been sort of slightly wary of uh, back from the days when I was a mortgage advisor. I mean, we're talking 20 odd years ago. I'm sure it's a different market now, but that's surely going to be problematic in a world of sort of mass furloughing and uh, presumably anticipated uh, lots, um, a, a big rise in unemployment in the next few months and years. Yeah, that's our problem with short-term policies mm. is that insurers simply remove them, take them off the market just when people need them. Okay. So the, the, the main protection markets of, of disability insurance and critical illness insurance and life insurance, those are rightly long-term contracts. So someone takes them out for five years, 10 years, 20, mm. 25 30 years, uh, for as long as you think you will need that kind of cover. And you pay a premium, uh, a relatively small premium, because you take them out early for a long time, shall we say. Uh, and then you've got that cover in place, and it can't be taken away from you. Uh, the, the insurance company can't do anything about it. Mm. The, um, th- that's, that's the deal. Whereas unemployment, uh, ASU, accident sickness cover, but uh, those kind of covers, they're, they're generally one-year contracts. Right. So boom, insurers have just removed them from the market now. And if you had the cover, and you wanted to review to renew your cover, you can't. Okay. But hang on, this is just when I need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right, but that's the risk we don't want to take. So uh, and the insurer's position is actually defensible. I won't bother doing that, but it is defensible <laughs> just. But uh, we just think that's the wrong way to arrange this kind of cover. And if there was an unemployment uh, uh, policy that, that people would take out and was affordable that would run for 20 years, then we might market it. But there isn't such a thing in, in, in the market. Mm. So no, unemployment is best dealt with by savings. Easy to say that now. Obviously, very very hard to save anything now for yeah, most sure. people. But uh, yeah, it's, it's sickness and disability that we think is the longer term uh, 
very the cat the catastrophic threat yeah for sure i absolutely agree with that I always say income protection obviously you and i have spoken about that before uh coupled with an emergency fund, uh, if possible, as you say, that's going to be difficult for many people to scrape together now. But you know, as and when things return to some kind of normal, folks' first job must be really to get some kind of a cash buffer behind them. There really is no substitute uh, for that. And then when that runs out, um, you know, the, uh, the policy, uh, income protection policy, could kick in after that. So it's a combination of those two things really, which provides a lot of protection. How about the insurers? Tom, because I mean, obviously, you know, they, they are just enormous uh, companies. Let's, let's, let's just push the insurers back a, a, okay. a, a yeah. step if we can, because we were just on the consumer there. Okay. And, and I do sense uh, in the conversations we're having with customers, uh, and we have thousands of those a day, that the, uh, how can I put this? The understanding of a need to improve personal financial resilience is growing. Okay, that's encouraging. Um, uh, and this this crisis is um, uh, in- encouraging people to uh, work out how they can better manage their finances um, and how they can better protect themselves against catastrophe. So, so th- there is a it, the world is just much more serious now mm. uh, than it was for all of us, um, and. That means that people do take their personal finances a bit more seriously than they did. Now, I'm just so aware that I'm talking about people who have a bit of money. Yeah, sure. um, there, are, there are all those who don't. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that is, that, 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 that's a different story. Sure. But uh, we do see uh, family resilience uh, basically rising um, in focus and uh, probably therefore in, in, in reality in due course. Um, oh. So, but but moving moving across to the insurers, um, the uh, they've done on the whole extremely well. There were a couple who were caught short, uh, and just for a while, laptops were like toilet paper. You couldn't yeah. buy one for love and the money across Europe. Um, but uh, they've they've got through that now, and uh, so all the main insurance companies are trading. In fact, all the insurance companies we deal with, and, and we're whole of market, so that's all of them <laughs> um, are uh, are trading fine. Um, and getting almost all of their teams working remotely. Um, some have done brilliantly. Uh, one or two have uh, framed their COVID questions, which all have introduced, but some have framed them so that uh, NHS uh, workers or health workers uh, don't have to answer the uh, trickiest ones okay. uh, for them uh, about being in proximity with people um, or two people who've had COVID. Uh, and uh, others have done brilliant work on um, people, customers, existing policyholders needing to take uh, premium holidays. So across the market, there's a lot of good practice. One or two uh, insurers so far, I'm just writing a a letter now to the reinsurance market who kind of control this a bit, saying, back off, guys, this is not good, because one or two are increasing their, uh, they're just declining or postponing older customers who uh, have some health conditions. And while you can understand that from a, a, an insurance company's point of view, actually that's nonsense. It's, it's right now that the uh, vastly wealthy reinsurers and insurers have to uh, um, support their mm. consumer base mm. uh, and take on the, the relatively small amount of risk uh, that they're being asked to uh, in that space rather than shying away from it. And I'm particularly talking about those people who had already applied for cover pre-COVID and were in okay. underwriting who now in some cases face a, a change in a change in the rules midway through the underwriting process. Don't like that at all. No. But apart from that glitch, and there have been a few others, but uh, the, the overall performance of the insurers has been uh, manifestly very, very good. good. And um, we've been delighted with them. The trick is, though, at a time like this, when underwriting is uh, more difficult and is vital to get right, uh, that's when the whole of market position comes into play. Quite a lot of our competitors really only deal with two or three or four insurers. Uh, they don't boast about that, but that is the truth of it. Uh, and suddenly that's that's a very tight market if one of your insurers is uh, not playing ball. Mm. But anyway, we've always set our stall out uh, to, to deal with the whole market. So we can find cover pretty much for everybody. Uh, we could find cover for before COVID. 
do you anticipate sort of long-term changes in the insurance market, the protection market? Do you think this being so unprecedented will uh, trigger a sort of rethink in some areas, whether that's underwriting or processes or work patterns? In Let's sort of think about it, perhaps given that we're talking about the insurers, think about it from their point of view, and then perhaps we can talk about the intermediary uh, market like uh, advisors, and, you know, life search and people like that. I think the... Um... <sighs> In terms of working patterns, I think, I think yes, uh, uh, there seems a, a total consensus that everything's going to be different after this. Certainly, we have lots of people in, a, a, in our business who, who never wanted to work from home who now say, actually, I really don't want to come back because I'm just <laughs> loving not commuting. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, put up with a bit of loneliness for that or only come in sometimes. So I imagine the insurers will move to remote working uh, to, to, to a much greater degree. Um, they generally quite slow to do this sort of stuff, but this this whole experience will act as an accelerant of change mm. in that regard. In terms of the way policies are defined and designed, I don't really have any sort of, what's the word, shaft of brilliant insight that says <laughs> this is going to change that. It seems to me that policies are doing their job right now. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're managing claims, not just from COVID, of course, from all sorts of uh, reasons for people getting disabled and getting... Uh, and dying, and um, those are those are all continuing, and the policies are, are meeting their needs, and claims are being paid out, and the insurers are striving to to do really well on that front. That was what they all prioritised to begin with, which was great to see. Yeah, really. Um, so, I don't know. Don't think huge change. I, I think more a serious change across society, both in the way we work. Perhaps employers will take more responsibility, and mm. there'll be more group disability policies arranged and more group life insurance policies arranged. Um, maybe, uh, maybe work will become more atomized. It was already pretty atomized with the sort of gig economy, but maybe, you know, if you're working from home, being employed suddenly just feels very different and the yeah. step to being self-employed pretty small, really. Yeah. Um, so uh, there, there are all sorts of societal changes, which are not my brief to opine yeah. on, uh, at <laughs> least not until you push a pint of beer in my hand. But the, <laughs> yeah, um, right. Uh, the the uh, change in the insurance market, I suspect, will be relatively small uh, mm -hmm. and steady. Uh, what, are, what am I talking about? Evolution rather than a revolution. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I was quite encouraged to hear you say that um, families seem to be uh, prioritizing self-reliance a little bit more and I can't remember the exact word you used if I had a notebook I'd have written that down um, but just uh, thinking about this stuff more and making sure that they are more resilient on a financial footing of course you know there are vast swathes of the population for whom that just isn't possible right now and may not be uh, in the near future at all but I'm quite encouraged by that I wonder whether this whole situation will lead to something of a reset um, and just think about what's truly important and uh, becoming less um, blasé about life and not just sort of coasting through. Do you have a, a view on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I also think if you are in work, if you're not furloughed uh, and you haven't taken a huge pay cut, uh, then you're suddenly looking at your bank balance thinking, goodness me, that's going up. Mm. <laughs> uh, I'm not spending anything like I used to. Uh, and so you're suddenly getting a, a, an absolute demonstration of how, uh, I think the technical word is fiscal restraint, but anyway, never <laughs> mind that, how spending a bit less or, you know, restraining your spending on restaurants and booze and, and whatever else uh, and confining yourself to necessities and a bit of um, Amazon impulse, I suppose you could call it, uh, doing that, uh, it, how suddenly that actually means that your, your bank balance rises. Um, and... Uh, that being the case, then, then you're, you're getting everyone is getting a first-hand demonstration. Everyone for whom that is happening, uh, we're being very careful to, yeah, sure. to be inclusive in our thinking here, but uh, and rightly so. But the, the, so everyone who, for whom that is happening uh, is getting a, uh, a an example of just what a bit of financial restraint can achieve. And yes, that suddenly means that there is a bit of money spare to do the right thing, to start saving, to protect yourself against catastrophe, which is. Well, you know what, what we do mm. um, because what we insure people against is catastrophic um, to them personally. So, mm. yeah, I, I think that will be a growing trend. Uh, and I tell you what, I really hope. I really hope that all the various retailers out there uh, respond to that trend responsibly. I have a, a great fear of, of marketing genius getting out and flogging uh, inadequate life insurance policies to people because you can make lots of money doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I really hope that the insurers uh, and the regulators 
just make sure that uh, the product and the sales behaviors, Life Search doesn't sell insurance, we protect families. Mm. That, that, that's our guide to, to our behavior because you, you really can't do that badly. Otherwise, you're, you're a horrible person. Uh, but regulators and everyone should just make sure that what is coming out of the retail market to consumers who are increasingly interested is good quality, mm. is, is advised, is, is proper stuff, not just, um, you know, pushed down a phone and flogged. I, I agree. I've long thought that a lot of the ills in the financial services world in, in, uh, in history are down to companies getting involved in stuff they've never historically done. <laughs> and I'm yeah. sure that's a potential risk going forward. Okay, now, Tom, as ever, it's great to get your insights into everything. Any sort of last thoughts on uh, where we find ourselves at the minute? Pete, I think the, uh, the, the points we've made, uh, you know, we all uh, kind of think we're immortal until we aren't. Uh, and uh, if your listeners are uh, taking their protection needs more seriously, um, then that's great. I kind of figure your listeners are already a bunch that do that. So it's, uh, it's getting it out there into the wider, wider world that we need to do. Uh, so I think that will happen. I, I, I think our, um, our markets uh, serves its customers well in times like this. It's just vital that customers buy properly. Mm. Take great care over who they're buying from and what they're buying, um, and uh, make sure that they're dealing with uh, advisors they can that they can rely on, uh, and not people making a quick buck. I hundred percent agree, and I think it's worth mentioning again, as I've mentioned in the past. Uh, Meaningful Money has uh, a deal with Life Search, so that um, if you go to meaningfulmoney.tv/lifesearch and call the number there, that gets you straight through to uh, Life Search's senior advisors. And without exception, Tom, everybody that's fed back to me about the experience that they've had with Life Search has been uniformly superb. So thank you uh, for that. And uh, that's a real testament to the company that you've built and the, the team that you have working for you. So Tom, stay safe, my friend. Thank you so much for your time once again. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers, Pete. Thanks very much indeed. Good luck. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. My thanks again to Tom Begri. He always has some interesting uh, stuff to say. I thought it'd be uh, useful to get the insight of uh, people who are dealing with life insurance at a completely unprecedented time in history. Uh, So I hope you enjoyed that. My thanks again to Tom uh, for giving me his time. So meaningfulmoney.tv slash life search is where you need to go. Uh, if you want to approach them, if you're thinking, you know what, I need to just think through my life insurance program, my income protection, they are advisors. So it's not for you to necessarily tell them what you want, although you can do that, of course. They will advise you and put together a package of insurance which is right for your circumstances. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash life search. And that link, the phone number on that link, takes you straight through to their senior advisors. Okay, so definitely check that out. It's a great process and a great company. Okay, so normal session on Wednesday. Not going to bother with reviews or anything at the end of this one. It's a normal session on Wednesday. We're picking up on the retirement planning season, uh, talking about some uh, practical financial housekeeping that you can do in retirement just to make your life a little bit easier. So I'll bring up the music. Say thank you for listening. Remember, notes, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 375. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 375. Thank you so much for listening. A little bit of extra meaningful money in your ears this Monday. Thank you for listening. I'll speak to you in just a couple more days. Cheers. Cheers.